moderator, don't hate me. I used a known bug to publish this. So you start to see that bug track that was formed because uh, the other guys weren't disclosing fully starts to get accused of not disclosing fully. Um, his stuff was interesting. He showed how to trace to find bugs. But probably the most interesting contribution uh, of his work was he introduced register springs. OK, so uh, on Windows, you most often find multi-threaded applications. And when you say jump, you actually have a good chance of not knowing where you are. And what he introduced in his paper was, when you overwrite EIP, don't just tell it to jump to the stack, because you don't know where the stack is. Find another DLL that's at a consistent place that has an instruction that says jump to the top of the stack. Point to it, and it will make you jump to the top of the stack. OK, it's a level of indirection that basically gives your exploits reliability. And you should notice it's um, also one of the things that start uh, down the ROP debate. Um, the frame pointer override was pretty cool. Uh, K-Log published it in FRAC. Again, I won't uh, give it a lot of attention. But essentially, what K-Log found was under certain circumstances, if you could just overwrite one byte um, of the saved frame pointer, when execution continued, you could make bad stuff happen. OK, and uh, the reason I'm skipping it here is you'll come up against it uh, now in 2010 when we discuss attacks against uh, ASLR. Um, so format string bugs then made a showing in, in 99. And it was interesting the way it happened. Basically, Tim Toolman makes a post to bug track saying, I was auditing FTPD. When you do this, you can get a shell. And until that point, not a lot of people uh, even knew of the attack vector at all. Um, I'll, I'll come back to format string bugs in a little bit. Um, I'm not going to pronounce that name at all. Uh, he published advanced buffer overflow exploits. But this period was basically dedicated to guys doing cool stuff with shell code. So don't just pop a shell, bypass get UID and set UID, bypass filtering, uh, put in alphanumeric shell code, stuff like that. Um, in 2000, there were, you'll see a few documents on bypassing stack guard and stack shield. Um, Later, a more interesting document shows up on FRAC for smashing C++ V pointers. And the reason why it's interesting is it's one of those attacks that still live. But essentially, when C++ objects are created, they create a table of function pointers. And essentially, if, if you remember, we were saying, well, what do we look for to overwrite? If you've got a table of function pointers sitting somewhere, it becomes uh, interesting and worth targeting. Um, again, something that we'll come to in a little bit. Um, in 2000, basically, Twitch at vicar.org, cool name, published a paper on non-terminated strings, the danger of non-terminated strings. And everyone knew that stir copy at this point was bad. OK, it's an unbounded copy. Bad stuff will happen. And uh, one of the points of Twitch's paper was even the blanket recommendation, use stern copy instead of uh, stir copy was also dangerous. OK, and if you read the man page, uh, stir and copy basically will tell you that if the buffer matches the size, it's not null terminated. OK, so if you tried to put uh, something that matched the size of the destination buffer, stir and copy won't null terminate. So essentially, if you were looking at two buffers that happen to live in memory like this, and you copied from buff 2 into buff 1, because it was bigger, it wouldn't overflow but it also wouldn't null terminate. OK, so you'd end up with something like that. And what you should see is if you try to print uh, buff 1 at this point, buff 1 is going to tell you it's all of that because it's not null terminated. OK, so it starts to become uh, attackable possibly later on. Um, so WUFTPD, uh, an exploit was published basically with that tagline. UFTPD providing remote root since at least 1994. And um, I remember speaking to FX a little while back, who basically said that he thinks WFTPD is the equivalent of OWASP's web, web goat, where they took one piece of code and tried to put as many bug classes as possible in that one piece of code. Um, but it was instructive. Um, so what's interesting here is when Toolman published his, hey, these are format string bugs, People didn't really take notice. You weren't running pro FTPD, you probably canned it. 
this was an exploit for WUFTPD that suddenly showed up in the wild, giving you remote root using a format string bug. Okay, and so suddenly people went, hey, what's this format string stuff? Okay, um, following that, um, him published a two-line paper, a 200-line paper on format strings on bug track. And considering it was a 200-line paper, he was actually really comprehensive. He gave examples of how the exploit works, why it works, pointed to other FTPDs that had the same uh, vulnerability in it. But interestingly enough, he did the first serious documentation of format string bugs, and very few people actually credit him with it. Um, so one of the things when you discuss format string bugs is that people will quickly tell you that it's really easy to spot a format string bug so it very quickly got hunted into extinction. And this is true. Um, static analysis finds format string bugs. So as a bug class, it was one of the first bug classes to almost completely disappear. Okay, which of course uh, makes that OSVDB trolling that I was doing interesting because what you find is that as late as 2009, Oracle was still uh, patching format string bugs in their Oracle server. Um, the other thing that I'll quickly pick on here is if you notice, it took them two years to fix that format string bug. Um, and just to show you that it wasn't once off, they actually had two format string bugs, but this time it only took them a year because clearly they put processes in place. <laughs> um, so the next thing we touch on again is to go back to Skynet. And uh, basically, Solar Designer made this really low key post to bug track. Uh, titled JPEG COM Marker Processing Vulnerability in Netscape Browsers. And like most of his posts, there's lots of information in it. On the one hand, he basically points you to file format bugs that will become uh, rich hunting grounds for the next few years. And, and then he says, hey, read this whole post because you'll probably uh, get more information from it. And essentially what he did was he documented the first use of heap exploits as really reliable generic exploits. Okay, and um, essentially what he did was he showed how to attack um, an unlink operation. Okay, so really quickly, um, a doubly linked list is a computer science uh, data structure, and essentially you've got these elements that have a, well, that have a link to the previous element and to the next element. Okay, and so um, because of what it's named, most guys will call this the F-link and the B-link, the forward pointer and the previous pointer. Okay, so what we're focusing on here is node eight that sits in the middle of seven and nine, funnily enough. Um, it has a back pointer to seven and a forward pointer to nine. Okay, and what Solar essentially uh, documented was that when unlink is called, so if you wanted to remove eight from this list, Essentially, what you would have to do is go to the previous node, okay? So you're gonna to go to seven and point it to nine, and you're going to go to nine and point it to seven. Okay, it's perfectly simple. You're basically removing that node from the list and saying, here's who you should be pointing to as your next guy, and here's who you should be pointing to as your previous guy. But what you should also see is this becomes a form of a right what where? Okay, because if you can say, in place of my previous pointer, if you can say, write this at EIP and write this value, essentially what it's going to do is go to that location and write that value. Okay, and suddenly heap overflows that were until this point considered almost not exploitable suddenly become uh, trivially exploitable and uh, it's still a bug class that lives uh, today. Um, Horizon, John McDonald, uh, is supposed to have said something like, we're all just finding out stuff that Solar Designer forgot to write down. Um, so format string attacks, there was another paper by Tim Newsham, again, covers the whole thing. It's worth finding and reading just because he's got a really interesting writing style. So he starts off his whole paper talking uh, essentially about you at a dinner party and a friend comes up to you and says, what's a format string bug? You're nervous, how do you react? Um, it's fairly interesting in a geeky sort of way. Um, so in 2000, PAX releases, and essentially PAX is a patch for the Linux kernel um, that tries to end exploitation. Okay, and we're gonna see PAX coming up uh, again and again. 
Uh, essentially, what PAX does is the x86 processor at this point, the page table doesn't support a bit for whether something's executable or not. So it basically says, is the stuff readable or is the stuff writable? But everything's executable. And so PAX uses um, some clever mojo that we'll discuss later um, to basically force, uh, force protection on, on regions of, of space. Um, the mProtect patch that they added was then to try to defend against solar designers' uh, return to libc attack. Um, the detours section, at this point in exploitation, we're looking at, we've got these attacks, we, we still get to choose where we want to write, and people were basically coming up with, well, let's find cleverer places to write. Okay, and uh, Juan M. Bello Rivas published a paper that essentially said, um, applications compiled in GCC have constructors and destructors, so code that runs before or after something, and these uh, destructors exist whether you compile them into your code or not. So essentially he said if you can overwrite a destructor instead of overwriting EIP, when, code in, uh, when the application ended, the destructor is run and your code executes. Um, in 2000, uh, Brad Spengler, uh, Spender, uh, released GR Security. Um, Spender becomes interesting, if for no other reason, because if you don't know him, you should go back uh, and Google Brad Spengler or Spender and his post to the Linux uh, kernel mailing list. Um, essentially, uh, he does GR Security, which works very closely with PAX, and it's a whole bunch of security mechanisms for Linux that PAX doesn't cover. So in the future, it'll become RBAC and it'll become ACLs and stuff like that. Um, in 2001, IIS, uh, the IDA ISAPI bug hits wild, code red goes out. There's fancy graphs showing how many things were exploited that we'll skip because I'm running out of time. In 2001, PAX introduces address-based layout randomization. Okay, there's two things I want you to notice here. One is, it's safe at this point to think of PAX as a spoiler of this presentation. Because without PAX, you can kind of look at the timeline and everything kind of makes sense. There was an attack, there was a defense. With PAX, everything breaks because PAX solved lots of these problems way back in 2001. People just weren't using it. Um, so with address-based layout randomization, you'll remember in terms of, of the attacking that we're doing, we get to say, we're gonna overwrite stuff, what should we overwrite? One of the fundamental things that we need to know is the layout of memory. Where is system living? Where is my EIP living? Okay, and PAX's uh, solution at that point was to randomize memory. So even if you overwrote a buffer, even if you got to say where you should go next, you wouldn't know, okay? Um, and you'll see this solution show up in commercial systems uh, in a few years. So Stack, Guard, Stack Ghost was released, which is a kernel patch, Format Guard to protect against format bugs. Format Guard was also by Crispin Cowan, but like I say, the bug class died everywhere except Oracle, so didn't really take off. Um, there were two papers in FRAC that essentially documented uh, Solar's attack. Uh, the first one, Voodoo Malatrix, basically went into great detail on the Dougley uh, allocator gave a lot of information on how you can exploit these things. Um, what's interesting in 2001 is Nurgle, uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, published advanced return into libc exploits. And if you look at the documentation on what return-oriented programming is today, you almost couldn't tell the difference with what Nurgle's published uh, way back in 2001. Um, for those of you who don't know him, so he published exploits then for almost everything, and today he uh, works for Joanna Rutkowska with Invisible Things Labs, um, which gives you a scary amount of talent in one place. Um, in 2002, Dave Vitel publishes Spike, his block-based fuzzer, kind of revives interest in fuzzing and basically points out how many applications fall to fairly simple fuzzers. Um, Halva Flake then does a talk called Third Generation Exploits. And, and Halva's talk was interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. The one thing is he showed Solar's four byte unlink exploit on the Windows platform, okay, which wasn't done up until that point. He then documents a heap attack against Borland's heap allocator. 